ask everyone to take a moment and look at your hands. So go ahead, take a look at them. What do you see? What do you think about when you look at your hands? Do you think to yourself, wow, my hands are amazing. <laughs> they help to get me through my day in ways I can't even count. Or do you think about holding the hand of someone you love? I think about those things. But when I look at hands, I also see 15 million germs. And I think, what surfaces have these hands touched? And what was on those surfaces? And I think how hands, mine, yours, anyone's, how under some circumstances can be silent killers with a simple touch. Every day when I go to work as an infectious disease microbiologist, I handle bacteria that could kill you. As such, people often wonder if I'm a germaphobe. It's a good question. At work, yes, I have to be. I have a responsibility to make sure the resistant organisms I work with don't escape the lab. But in my everyday, regular life, do I constantly worry about germs? Well, it depends. When at home, if food falls on the floor, I firmly believe in the three-second rule, especially when dessert is involved. <laughs> Where I am a stickler, though, is when it comes to hand hygiene. Because the simple act of cleaning hands is our first line of defense to preventing infections for ourselves and others. Now, this notion that germs from our hands cause infection is generally understood today. But that wasn't always the case. Once upon a time, illnesses were largely thought to be caused by evil spirits and foul-smelling air called miasma. It wasn't until the mid-1800s where we have, like, medicine becomes more scientific. And we have a Hungarian physician named Ignaz Samowise, who was so disturbed by the mortality rates of women dying in the medical student ward as compared to the midwife ward of childbirth fever, that he set out to understand why they were dying at such alarming rates. After many failed attempts, he finally made a connection that the root cause of the fevers and untimely deaths were because of cadaver particles. Now, he didn't know that these cadaver particles, as he called them, were actually bacteria. However, by implementing a rigorous hand and instrument cleaning process, he was able to reduce the mortality rates from 18% to below 2% in just two months. After an amazing discovery like this, one would think that Samwise was revered as a savior of women, receiving praise and accolades from his colleagues. Mm, not so much. Although Samwise correctly identified the problem, he went about mobilizing change in all the wrong ways. Instead of gently bringing his colleagues around to his understanding, he chastised them. He called them irresponsible murderers. Thus, they turned against him. And with enough time, he vexed them so thoroughly, they had him committed to an insane asylum where he was severely beaten and died 14 days later from childbirth fever. Although not appreciated at the time, Samuel Weiss's discovery is just as important and powerful today. We all know when we're supposed to clean our hands, right? We learn about this as toddlers. You're supposed to clean your hands before touching food, after cleaning up after a pet or a child, after touching dirty surfaces in public, like doorknobs and elevator buttons, and of course, after we go to the bathroom. This is not earth-shattering news. What might be earth-shattering is that we're in the midst of an infection crisis all over again where one in 25 patients that go into the hospital come out with an infection they didn't have to start with. In 2011, the CDC reported 750,000 hospital-acquired infections in US acute care hospitals alone. And of those infected patients, 75,000 of them died. 
That's more deaths than prostate, breast, colon cancer, or diabetes. Each year, these infections cost between 28 and $45 billion. But there is no figure that can be placed on the burden incurred by patients and their families. And unfortunately, I have met too many families who, like mine, have been affected by these kinds of infections. Years ago, when my research focus moved away from antibiotic discovery to infection prevention, I wanted to be part of making sure future patients would not become a statistic. This was particularly at the forefront for me during my dad's recent open heart surgery and recovery. So again, it might be a surprise to learn that what Samwise correctly identified, this hand hygiene issue, 170 years ago, is still at the core of the infection crisis we have today. How can this be? Well, it turns out cleaning hands is not as simple as you might think. But instead of me just telling you about it, now comes the audience participation part. So in the, as you are coming in, you are all handed hand sanitizer. So together, we are going to learn how to clean our hands like healthcare workers, according to the World Health Organization. Now, what's important for you to understand is that when you're talking about the level of clean, or efficacy as we call it, it's going to be dependent on a very specific volume deposited in a very specific manner over a very specific amount of time. And really, what I need you to remember is you need enough product on your hand to cover the surface of both hands because sanitizer can't kill what it doesn't touch. So we're going to put a good dollop. <laughs> I'm not going to say full palm full, because then it'll take forever, but a really good amount to cover the surfaces. And now what we're going to do, try not to splash yourself in the eyes, <laughs> is we're going to go palm to palm. And we're going to go with one palm to the back of the hand. Very good. And switch. Good, and now we're gonna go back palm to palm, fingers interlaced apart. Good, you're not done yet. Now you've gotta do the backs of your fingers and the tops of your nail bed, switch hands. Really important, don't forget your thumb. This is the most commonly missed part of hand hygiene. And don't forget your fingertips. Okay, and now we wait, because they're still wet. This is important. Your hands are not considered clean or safe until they are dry. The active ingredients are still working on killing the organisms. So now that we've all done that, how was that? By a show of now clean hands, how many of you have done this kind of cleaning before? Oh, that's good, all right. Keep your hands up. How many of you do this level of cleaning every single time? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Who has time for that, right? So <laughs> data suggests that we can't even get people to clean their hands when you know you're supposed to. So for example, one out of five people opt to not wash their hands after using the bathroom. Wait, wait, I want you to think about this for a moment. So look down your row and maybe the row in front of you or behind you. 20 people did not wash their hands after using the bathroom today. How many hands have you been shaking so far? <laughs> Aren't you glad we just cleaned our hands? I know I am. So <laughs> when you think about it, as individuals, it's kind of OK for us to make poor hand hygiene choices, especially when we're healthy. The reality is, is that our robust immune system is going to take care of any of the germs that we inadvertently leave behind. However, what are the ramifications when a healthcare worker in a hospital, nursing home, dialysis center, or emergency room can't clean their hands the right way every single time? Every interaction between a patient and a healthcare provider is an opportunity to prevent an infection or transmit one. 
which makes sense because practitioners are around germs, infections, and sick people all day. So let's talk time for a moment. If a practitioner were to clean their hands using soap and water every time they task switch as recommended by the World Health Organization, they would be cleaning their hands for half of their shift. That would be half of their day not focused on direct patient care. When using popular hand rubs like we just did, that's still one quarter of their day dedicated to cleaning hands. The practitioners I've spoken to barely have time to go to the bathroom during the day, never mind dedicate this much time to cleaning hands. So they're forced to cut corners. They only can clean hands going in and out of patient rooms. And that leaves numerous opportunities for germs to be spread. 170 years ago, Samuel Weiss tried to save lives by getting people to wash their hands. Today's hospital administrators are essentially asking the exact same thing. But in today's system, things are different. What is asked of the healthcare worker is not feasible and likely wouldn't solve the problem anyway. For a moment, let's wave our magic wand, pretend that we live in a world where everything in a healthcare setting is feasible. Given the hand hygiene products we have access to today, it still might not be enough to prevent the spread of infection. How can this be? Well, let's take a look. If an invisible sneeze droplet contains 200 million germs, and our sanitizer kills 99.99% .99 of them, take a moment to do that mental math, move the decimal four places, ew, that's 20,000 germs that are left behind. That is more than enough to spread an infection to one of our stick figure friends, especially if that friend is in the hospital. And to complicate things, hand sanitizers can't even kill all of the important pathogens or germs that are found in hospitals today, like highly contagious norovirus or debilitating Clostridium difficile, also called C. diff, which can survive on surfaces for up to eight months. So what we have on our hands are likely a lot of germs and a problem that cannot be solved solely with an individual behavior change. We need innovation. And it seems really tempting to think, surely we have a solution to the problem. We just need to get people to do it. Right? We have easy access to soap and clean water. We have sanitizer on every wall and door jam. On the go, sanitizers go, come in every color, shape, size, fragrance, disinfecting wipes, towelettes, sprays, foams, gels. Yet, the spread of infection still persists. How can that be? Well, it turns out that despite the fact that sanitizers come in a variety of forms, they all use the same active ingredients that were formulated more than 40 years ago. If cell phone technology stalled in the 1980s, this is what would be in your fanny pack right now. That's right, I said fanny pack because this doesn't fit in your pocket. So I ask you, how can we ask healthcare workers to use the equivalent of an 80s style technology and then hold them accountable for not fulfilling 21st century expectations in their work. How did we get here? So, I largely believe that innovation has stalled in the hand hygiene space because of antibiotics. So during World War II, the development of penicillin saved countless soldiers' lives from dying in the trenches. In fact, penicillin is so good at treating infections that in the 1950s and 60s, it ushered in the golden age of antibiotic discovery. And without a doubt, antibiotics continue to play the role of unsung hero, saving millions of lives today. However, the development and commercialization of antibiotics 
had negative side effects that exacerbate the problem in hospitals today. With a cure for bacterial infections in hand, we stopped innovating ways to prevent the infections from beginning. And because we had no idea of the downstream consequences, our misuse and abuse of antibiotics has led to the formation of resistant organisms like superbugs, which are increasingly more difficult to treat. And the presence of those resistant superbugs means that prevention is more critical than ever, given our inadequate current methods. So are there things that you can do? Yes. Among them, don't misuse antibiotics. Only take antibiotics for confirmed bacterial infections. They don't work against viruses. Take them exactly as prescribed, and always, always, always finish your course even when you're feeling better. And when out and about, let's make smarter choices about when and how thoroughly to clean our hands, like during cold and flu season, or when handling raw chicken. And Wash your hands after using the bathroom every single time. Stress gross not to. And when visiting the hospital, be mindful that every surface you come in contact with could harbor dangerous germs. And those germs could be passed along to unsuspecting victims. And when visiting your loved ones, remember they are more vulnerable to infections. So clean your hands often and try not to touch them. I know that's hard. After my dad's surgery, everyone who came to visit wanted to share their concern and extend a tender touch and sympathy, but I was vigilant in making sure <laughs> every single person who entered his room cleaned their hands and limited unnecessary contact. I know I offended some, but I am grateful my dad did not become a statistic. So are there things that we can do as individuals? Yes. But we also need to look beyond individuals. We need to look at the problem holistically. We need for companies, researchers, hospital administrators to prioritize innovating in the infection prevention space. 170 years have passed since we discovered clean hands save lives. Our friend Samwise was unfairly condemned to an insane asylum for mobilizing change in all the wrong ways. However, continuing to do the same things we have been doing and expecting a different outcome, it's its own form of insanity. So I challenge you to join me, thinking outside of the box, in developing better ways to prevent the spread of infections in hospitals that will work in today's hospital setting. Together, we must have the courage to reject the status quo and usher in a transformative hand hygiene revolution. Thank you for listening.